Today, we're going to dive into the why and the when you should start thinking about wealth planning, especially as a business owner. Because for most business owners, the bulk of your wealth is tied up in your business. Let's hear from an expert today. You understand your business. You understand that, sp that space, that realm that you're an expert in, and you can control the levers of power, and you feel very comfortable with that, but it's still a concentrated risk. The professionals that you surround yourself with as a business owner is highly impactful to the net outcomes that you have later in life, right? It's important that you perform the due diligence to surround yourself with the appropriate people in all of those spheres. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Decision Points. I'm Doug Hudson. I'm Scott Wood. And welcome Kayla Bryan, Director of Wealth Planning at True North. What's One of up? our own. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. You got blue on. You're, we're all inside the family here. We're in the True North spirit. That's right. True North blue. Let's go. Well, heard a rumor. Actually, it's fact. You went to the state fair yesterday. I did. Um, and it's kind of a longstanding tradition for my family. Uh, we've been going as a family group for about 30 years now, um, kind of as long as I can remember since I've been I was kid. about to ask you, can you, what's the first memory you have of it? Uh, probably the light parade that they do at the end of the day and all the floats and kind of things that they have, uh, you know, as a kid, that's extremely cool. It's cool as an adult too, but no offense uh, to big techs. I would have could have <laughs> yeah. thought it would have been big techs this giant, uh, no. Uh, Big Tech's probably scares kids. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, he definitely... I had my two-year-old with me yesterday, and he didn't know quite what to think about Big Techs. When he started talking, he was kind of <laughs> up there going, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. It was loud and, you know, deep voice. And, and it's weird. It's a little bit creepy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a thing. Corny dog. Yeah, of course. Corny yeah. dog, you know, buffalo chicken and a flapjack. And, uh, no, no, go back. Don't bury the lead there. Buffalo chicken in a pancake? Yeah, well, you know, the, the spirit of the fair is how do we outdo ourselves from the prior year every year with deep fried goodness? 100%. So, uh, I think it was a fair winner maybe eight or ten years ago, and they take a buffalo chicken and they dip it in pancake batter and they fry it and then you eat it. So you get hot, like Nashville style hot chicken wrapped in pancake bread. He's, he's there. With, with no, I'm not to there. Dip it in. <laughs> I'm not there. I can eat a corny dog. I could eat some fried food, but I'm not sure that's the really? the thing I would go for. Just go for. to CrossFit at one extra day. No, uh, I, no I don't know. That was just, breakfast. I have, a, I, have, I have a thing with wings. You do? Yeah. Bad experience once. Oh. Yeah. You want to talk about it? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure no one wants to hear it no, probably No, they don't. Either. They definitely don't. Uh, how big was the posse that went yesterday? Oh, gosh. Probably nine deep. Yeah, uh, my 94-year-old grandfather was oh, with sweet. us. He's been going every year with us as well. So uh, this is maybe the second year he's had to had to do it on a little little scooter. But yeah. uh, it was fun. Those That's scooters great. are kind of fast and scary. Uh, I was how like, long slow down there. Been, is he a Texan? Uh there, he's uh, from New Mexico originally. Okay. How long has he been going though? Do you know? As long as we have, yeah, that's uh, so or cool. longer. So um, I don't actually know how long. But, yeah. What's uh, your favorite exhibit? Oh gosh, it changes year over year. You know, they have a big butter sculpture every year, which is kind of cool to see what they do. <laughs> uh, which what is they do this bit. year? Uh, it was a, a gentleman in a in a seat holding a piece of cotton candy up in the air, and uh, and then like a carousel. Uh, uh, maybe a parent, a child, or an older older sibling and a child. All like, out of like butter? Castle. All out of butter. So is this refrigerated? Yeah, it's refrigerated. Okay. It's indoors in the like uh, life size Embarcadero or building. Miniature or? Uh, it varies from year to year, okay. but it's, it's, uh, it's big. It's yeah. like 10,000 pounds of butter or something oh, they gosh. used to, to craft these things. So. And then they take it next door and then they deep fry that and then you eat that <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> maybe they break it down and use it for deep Because that used to be a thing, later. right? The deep fried that was stick a of butter, That right? was a thing one that year. That was a thing one year, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Now it's deep fried cheesecake and deep fried Reese's and deep fried whatever. Ever, so it's awesome uh all right tell us about you where were you raised yeah so i was born in abilene cowtown um and moved to mckinney texas uh, as a young kid and kind of grew up going through the public school system in mckinney um elementary school all the way through high school um my family in general is a mixture of 
uh, farmers and ranchers, agriculturally inclined folks uh, from eastern New Mexico and west Texas right okay. along the state line, uh, as well as some, some other uh, just kind of traditional blue-collar laborers, so mechanics and things like that. Um, Anybody in the family still farming or ranching? Uh not so much. Yeah, um, yeah. My my aunt and my uncle were kind of, I think, the last holdouts with cattle ranching. And I think they maybe still have 50 or 100 head of cows. Uh, and then my... That's a hobby to a West yeah, Texas Yeah, that's, a, that's person, a hobby right? by right. comparison to what they used to have. And my dad still does uh, show lambs. So he's got a, you know, a flock of about 50, 50 sheep and they do show lambs and are hugely involved in uh, all of that kind of agricultural development for kids. Now, you mentioned to this to me the other day, you got to help the listener and the uh, show lamb. I, I, you're going to have to unpack that a little bit because I know I had never heard those two words put together. Yeah. So um, it's big in agricultural communities where uh, local ranchers will take um, juvenile animals. So lambs, calves, uh, you know, little piglets and goats and things like that. And they uh, they either donate or sell them to local children's programs. And these kids who are growing up in 4-H or whatever they're doing, uh, they're really learning about the responsibility of caring for another living thing. Oh, and then yeah. also the confidence to get out in an arena with other children who are doing this and show the animal. Mm. And uh, it's time intensive, labor intensive. You know, you're feeding the animals with certain diet and regimen to get them ready for show and grooming them and, you know, putting them on a treadmill and beefing them up and, you know, <laughs> getting them ready to, to get them out there and show them and be judged. And so uh, these programs start with young kids who are five or six years old and go all the way up through high school. And it's, it's just a, a development of a skill set. And, um, you know, it's, it's formative. So mm -hmm. I never thought about that again. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale City. You grew up in a city. That's, that's essentially what 4-H. I mean, I'm, you, you're explaining that. And I'm thinking about the character, the, mm -hmm. the discipline, mm -hmm. just the things that you're going to learn. Uh, I get... I get stuck on the showing the lamb or the piglet. So obviously so much of it is the process to, um, right. And well, it, you know, it's a living creature, so it's yeah. not like here I painted this thing and I'm just going to go put it in front of a bunch of judges. Yeah. You have to control the animal and, and help yeah. it to, you know, help the judges to be able to see the best aspects of the animal live in the arena at that moment. Yeah. So, so um, does your dad raise these show lambs to then give or sell to, 4-H clubs around Texas or wherever. That's right. Um, he's he's got pretty good connections in New Mexico, Texas, uh, all the way up to you know Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota, Colorado, kind of wherever the agricultural community connects. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a national a national hobby, yeah. a national sport, so to speak. Um, so so he's is he in McKinney or in the area or no? My New dad Mexico? my dad lives in a, a good place. They, they all say it's a good place to be from. Uh, nobody wants to be there now, uh, supposedly. Um, but that's. He's in Hobbs, New Mexico. Okay, um, which yeah. is an oil filled, oil -filled town. Yeah. yeah, I guess it's good for him. He, yeah. it's, that's his home. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then you know, uh, I guess talking about my background. Yeah. So, um, parents are divorced and remarried when I was young. So I, I kind of have the bonus of having two sides of two families. Um, not everybody in that situation can say that. So I feel fairly fortunate to be able to say I came out of that with a bonus family. Yeah, it's well um, said. So my my mom and my stepdad are in Granbury. Um, which is a great place to get yeah. get away to on the weekends yeah. or when you have a little extra time. If you're if you want to get out of the big city of Dallas and Fort Worth, you can yep. kick off over there to the lake and a cute little downtown and plenty of stuff to do. But you you, you shared with uh, me, Caleb, just as again as you know, obviously you're part of the Tree North team. Decision mm -hmm. Points was um, an important name for this as we work with and um, leaders. There's key decisions in our lives, some we make, some we don't make, and kind of the uh, results and then how we um, respond to those. That's right. But that was a difficult decision point in your life. Um, talk to us a little bit about why that was difficult or what you learned even. Difficult and what you learned from that. Yeah. Um, without taking us too far down the rabbit trail, you know, I would just say, um, going through a, a major change in a family situation is never easy. Yep. Um, and the younger you are, but still, you know, conscious, it becomes a difficult proposition to understand yep. why yep. it's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very fortunate to be supported with love and understanding and care from everybody in my family. Yep. 
Um, but you know, the reality was it was a single mom with two kids yeah. mm -hmm. in Abilene working retail. Yeah. So not exactly wealthy, um, not exactly living in the best part of town. And, and then, uh, you know, there's the transition of moving to McKinney, which is a very different city than Abilene. Um, and it was kind of like suburbia Dallas, right? And one back then it wasn't nearly what it is today. It was, yeah. but it was still more suburbia than Abilene. That's right. But you had a choice in that situation as well. You had a decision, correct? If I understand the, the, your story right. Uh, not so much at that point that I have a choice. Okay. Um, but, you know, whenever a, a child comes from a split family, uh, whenever they turn 12 or 13, the court system kind of says, okay, well, yeah. you're old enough now that if you wanted to come back and say, hey, I'd rather live with dad or mom or whatever, then you could do that. Um, and that's a very difficult decision. No, I and obviously, yeah. both of your parents would love for you to, to live with them and be with them. So it puts you in a, in a difficult position as a yeah. child. And then you, you kind of think about, well, did I make the right choice later mm -hmm. on in your life and, or not? And uh, I mean, I'm glad I am where I am. Yeah. And I, I think yeah. I made the right choice. But And you made the choice to stay with mom I made McKinney. the choice to stay. Yep. That's right. Um, I decided that being in McKinney and staying there with my mom and all the places that I was kind of already plugged into the school and band and all of those different things was going to be where, where I probably should stay. So yeah, I was going to ask you, what were you into in high school? Uh, I was a big band nerd. Okay. So I played trumpet uh, since sixth grade, yeah. uh, both concert trumpet and jazz trumpet. I was the drum, drum major for several years for McK uh, McKinney high. So it was the guy up there you see on the podium waving his arms around. Was Kenny G your hero? No. <laughs> Come on, seriously? Trumpet. Not Kenny G's like clarinet stuff. Trumpet's like Miles Davis. Miles Davis. Yeah, yeah. Dizzy, yeah, yeah. Dizzy See, Gillespie and, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, all, yeah. you know, a bunch of, bunch of really cool guys from back in the day with yeah. outstanding music. So You still play today? Uh, not as much as I'd like to. Uh, you know, that's kind of something that requires a, a band, an ensemble around you to really feel like you're, right. you're able to plug in and play. But I still play guitar. I still sing. I still do things like that. So... You got um, any musical talent? None. Yeah, I none, guess, none I guess, whatsoever. I zero. Yeah, I, I zero. have a guitar. You do? I tried to take some lessons for a little while, and it went it went okay, but it's just slow moving. Yeah, you know, and it it just takes a lot of time and patience. That's right. And I've, so I've I, tried guitar at least ten to fifteen times in thirty years, yeah. and never make it past the calluses. I thing. think it. I think it. Like maybe later in life, yeah. different season than maybe. Not, not, no promises, but maybe. Maybe Thursdays at lunch, you start doing guitar lessons here at the office. Yeah, why not? Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's uh, never too late that's you right. know, I know. For, for new hobbies or new experiences. I agree with that. So walk us through from high school to college or what's yeah. next? What's next in those chapters of your life? Yeah. So came out of high school, you know, I was a kid who was smart enough that I never really had to study a whole lot um, and could kind of just take tests and do well. And that works really well in middle school and high school. And then you go off into the world and you go to college and you need a lot more discipline and a lot more of a regimen around what you do. Yeah. Um, and I did not have yeah. that at all. So um, I didn't really have a plan. I yeah. graduated and I, I had a little scholarship to uh, Collin County Community College for jazz. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll do that. And then I realized, you know what? I really don't want to be, you know, if you get a music degree, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to teach music. Yeah, uh, be a band director or do something like that. And I was like, you know, that's, I enjoy those things. That's a passion project for me. Yep. It's not what I want my career to be. Um, and so I kind of floundered a little bit. Didn't really know where I wanted to mm -hmm. go, what I wanted to do. Um, ended up following a relationship to another state, uh, going to a college that I had really no business being at, yep. uh, which was Mizzou. Yep. Um, had a very fun, but also challenging, call it year and a half there. Uh, making many mistakes and learning very many hard lessons. Um, eventually kind of had to hit the reset button. So, yeah. uh, okay, um, I need to figure something out. Uh, moved home, decided I would finish out an associate's degree at community college and, and kind of um, at least check that box and then decide what I wanted to do from there. At that point in time, I was staying with my dad and Hobbs and it's, you know, the oil field is prolific there. So, um, I was like, okay, well, you can make good money. I have an associate's degree. Yep, I, I know yep. people in the community. Um, and I had a job that you know, I could go get and, and work at and make, you know, probably a six-figure salary. Per, well, not salary, it's hourly, and you work a lot of hours. But it was making making six figures at, you know, 20-something years old. Absolutely. Um, I was like, okay, that sounds great. Um, but the reality was not as good as what it sounds like on paper. So it was a lot of long hours driving trucks and being out in the middle of nowhere with no one around you and chasing down chemical tanks and pulling coupons from an oil pipeline. And 
I was like, you know, this is, it's a job. Um, it's not a career. I'm not super mechanically inclined, so I can't say that I was talented at it. I was a very poor employee, um, still figuring things out. Um, and I said, this is not what I want to do with the rest of my life. Um, really because I didn't feel like I was helping anybody or doing anything important. Hmm. Um, I felt like I was checking the box on a, on a checklist of things to do, um, for some company that was making a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know, doing oil and gas and, and chemicals. But, um, I didn't feel like I was materially making an impact on the world or, or doing anything really beneficial to anybody, not even myself, because yeah. it's, it's long hours and, and not super great for your health. Mm -hmm. Um, so I said, okay, I've got to figure something else out. I need to go back to school. I need to get back into the educational world and finish my degree and kind of decide what I want to do from there. Um, I was with my dad in Hobbs at that time. My mom and my stepdad lived in Lubbock at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was a very easy and natural progression to go from Hobbs to Lubbock because Lubbock is about an hour and a half from Hobbs drive. Mm -hmm. um, so that was an easy transition. I had a soft landing pad there to get there and go, okay, well, I'm going to come here and do this. Um, kind of started that process, got enrolled at tech, um, was going through some other kind of decision points in my life. And also kind of had a moment of clarity. Well, I said, you know, I've always been interested in serving our country. Hmm. Um, that's something that has been uh, in my mind since high school. In fact, I nearly enlisted right out of high school and, hmm. and ended up getting talked out of it. Um, and I said, if I don't do this now, I never will ever because I'm going to get in school and I'm going to graduate and I'm going to start working. And I'm going to do all this stuff. And then my opportunity set to do that, the window of time I have to do that in my life is gone. Do you know where that started, that desire to serve the, our country? Um, I have from? some family members who served. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a, a great uncle who served in World War II. Um, we have members in our family who served in the Civil War. We have um, several members of our family who are in Vietnam. So there's, there's a history of it in my family, not maybe not directly in, in my right. branch of the family, but... So that some of it was that, um, I'm a student of history yeah. and I, I really enjoy reading about the foundations of our country, where we came from and why we're here. I think it helps us understand, you know, where we're at today as, yeah. as, as a society. And so uh, I had a strong also inclination just because of, um, kind of the adversity as a nation that we had to overcome to become what we are, mm -hmm. um, and a desire to give back. Hmm. Um, I figured, you know, if, if thousands, tens of thousands of people could give their lives over, many decades to, to get us where we are. The least I could do is give back four years. Hmm. Um, and so I chose, I, Thank you. I yep. oh, of course, um, I, I chose to do that. Um, yep. uh, so I did a big pros and cons list and I'm not really, <laughs> I'm not really a pro con list guy. Right. But I, I was like, but okay, join I'm, the military might be a good time to put a pros and cons. list. Yeah. On so I was like, well, what's my risk and what, you know, what am I giving up? And I, you know, I said, well, school's going to be there. Um, and I think this is going to help get me pointed in the right direction. It'll probably give me some discipline and some structure that I need in my life. And it did that. In fact, I would say it's probably the most important decision I ever made. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had people ask me, you know, well, you, you got deployed to Iraq. You spent, uh, you know, a year there. And if you knew that at the beginning, would you still sign up? And I was like, absolutely. I am here today because of the decision I made at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And I'm successful today because of the skills that I developed in the service. Um, the, the, uh, emotional and mental fortitude that it instilled in me, the discipline hmm. um, and the capabilities that it really gave me as a human being to uh, moderate myself and, and, and focus. Hmm. So uh, most important decision I ever made, probably best decision I ever hmm. made, um, totally changed my life and, and really turned, turned my, my whole world on its head and pointed me in the right direction. So tell us how, the, how you got to ultimately being enlisted and deployed because there's another step in there, right? Yeah, well, you got to you have to sign up. And you have to go through all the 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 process, um, and and most people don't know this, but it's actually really hard to join the military. They're recruiting anybody and everybody, but the disqualifiers are massive. Uh, yep. So your feet aren't arched enough, or you have some you know childhood history issue, uh, you're disqualified. And so it's actually a very select group of people that can actually do this. Mm -hmm. um, so I I went to the recruiter. I decided I wanted to continue to be able to go to school, so I chose to do a part time commitment. So I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the National Guard. Uh, I can still go to school. Um, I can go do my training on the weekends. And all I have to do really up front is go to uh, basic training and then infantry school. And I'm okay with that. So, um, so then there was the process, right? 
you got to go to a, a really like crappy government facility in Amarillo and <laughs> uh, meet with doctors that have been serv- in service for like 40 years. And, and you know, go through this whole, uh, you feel like you're in a processing plant basically yeah, because yeah. that's where they kind of, you collect- kind of are. yeah, that's where they collectively <laughs> process everybody who's interested in joining from all branches of the military in one place. Um, so I went through all that. I went to what we call Fort Benning, uh, the wayward school for boys at Fort Benning. I guess it's not Fort Benning anymore, but, um, so I went to infantry school at Fort Benning. I did basic training and AIT there, which is advanced individual training. Uh, they, they were doing a pilot program in the military called OSUT, which is one station unit training. So whereas most people go and do their, you know, nine to, to 11 weeks of basic training, and then they take a break and then they go somewhere else to do their advanced training. We just got locked in. We were all in the same place, all the same cadre, all the same drill sergeants, all the same uh, peers and, and fellow soldiers alongside you. And you just do the whole thing, basic training, and then another six weeks of infantry school hmm. on top of that. And so I came back from that, literally got home like two days before the semester started, jumped right into school at Texas Tech, did one semester there, and then boom, got the deployment notice. Hmm. Um, and so then spent the next almost two years of my life on active duty. Um, a big chunk of that time um, mixed between in-state and overseas training, getting ready to be in a war zone. And then I spent 10 months actually in country in Iraq um, in a gunner's turret on top of a Humvee. So The most honest reaction I have is I'm not sure I've ever talked to anybody that sat in that seat that you sat in, in a gunner's turret. Um, what do you take from it? It was an experience. Yep. Um, I don't proclaim to be a hero. Um, I was there in 2008, 2009, which was wildly different than many of the people who were there during the invasion in the beginning of the war. Um, did we get shot at? Yes. Were there IEDs? Yes. But um, it wasn't street, street by street, house by house combat. Right. right. Um, but the biggest takeaway I had from it and probably why it was most impactful was, A, the camaraderie you build with the people mm. you're there with. You're risking your lives. You're in a dangerous situation. Um, and you don't really have anybody to rely on, but those around you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a totally different experience than most people have. Mm-hmm. And then um, just being in really what's a third world country for a year, mm-hmm. call it, um, and seeing the community around you and seeing kind of the toll that mm. the war takes on a country and yeah. its surroundings mm-hmm. and um, families and people. So... You know, the majority of what we did there was escorting convoys all across the country, making sure they were safe and, mm-hmm. um, you know, getting fuel and supplies from, you know, the western side of Iraq into Baghdad or wherever to make sure it was didn't get hijacked or blown up or taken along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had a very, very small uh, con- contingency of our time that was spent doing personal security detail. So if, uh, you know, company commander or somebody needed to go speak with a local police chief or a sheikh, we would... Uh, go and be a security presence for them. Um, uh, Also a formative experience. Um, Very blessed to have made it home in in one piece and Mm -hmm. and without any major injuries. Um, Very blessed as as a unit, as a a unit to come home with all of our people and and Mm -hmm. not lose anyone. Um, The unit that replaced us within several weeks of of us leaving did start losing people. So Mm -hmm. uh, I call that the praying moms um, Mm -hmm. impact. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Do you keep up with your unit? Uh, it's hard because people come from all walks of life. Mm-hmm. I'd say there's a small contingency of people I keep in touch with mm-hmm. simply because um, they were my closest peers. They were yeah. people I was in my truck with or on, mis- on mission with every day. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, you build bonds that are kind of unbreakable. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to talk to them every day or even every year, but the minute that they call me up or send me a message, I'm instantly reengaged with them. For sure. And it's like we never stop talking. Yeah, yeah. so uh, to, I, I was thinking the same thing, but there'll be no surface relationship, really, so to speak, with those friends ever again. So you may not talk for four years. That's right. But if someone calls and needs, everybody's there. That's right. Because that... Um, risking your life together and, and literally having only each other to depend upon mm-hmm. us. It's a bond that is yeah. difficult to recreate. Oh, yeah, okay. that's right. And, you know, we came back without losing anybody, but we lost people after we came back. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, everybody forgets that the war continues on with individuals afterwards. Yeah. So um, veteran suicide is a big deal. Yep. And it's a real thing and, and have a handful of people that I've lost that way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one gentleman on Christmas Day, um, other people self-destructing through mm-hmm. alcohol abuse or whatever it happens to be. And I wasn't really uh, 
fully right with society when I got back. It took yeah. me several years to reacclimate and become a normal person. Yeah. So, but I came back, I re-enrolled in school. Uh, I kind of felt like um, uh, Adam Sandler when he's in the movie where he's like the adult going back to school, Billy Madison, he's surrounded <laughs> by children. Well, by the way, that's a repeat of the movie called Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> okay, that so, one too. You're too young to know that, but go look at the version before Billy Matt. Love Adam Sandler. Yeah. But go look up uh, Rodney Dangerfield's version as well. Okay. But yeah, so I was the, you know, 26 year old. Combat, Freshman, combat veteran, <laughs> yeah, in and a, in a, in, you know, philosophy. One, think about all the wisdom you had, though. It was, uh, it was a struggle, um, but I made it through. Texas Tech was a phenomenal experience for me, and I was recruited into the financial planning program at Texas Tech totally by accident. I had no idea what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't even know that the world of wealth management existed. To be honest, um, I remember I was slated to be an international business major. Mm -hmm. And I had many friends who had graduated with this degree and they were all like, Hey, we can't find a job. Hmm. And I was like, okay, well, I don't want to do that. Yeah, thing. that doesn't sound yeah. good. Let's change course here. Um, and so I went to the career counseling office and I had a, uh, an interview set up with the counselor and I was sitting there in the chair waiting for my interview and in comes this, uh, cowboy-esque version of, uh, Jeff Goldblum. And so he reminded me of is a gentleman uh, named Bill Gustafson, who's kind of legendary in the program. And he's, he, I think he must have recruited at least 60% of kind of the first 10 years of graduates or 20 years of graduates of that program. Cause mm. he just, he's, he would meet a, a waitress at Chili's and be like, you would be great in our program. You should come take it. Awesome. And he would go to the, the counseling office and just talk to people who didn't know what they wanted to do mm -hmm. because he was passionate about the program and he helped, helped create it and guide it. And so he said, why don't you come take my intro course? And I was like, I don't even know what personal financial planning is, but he talked me into it. I took the course and I loved it. Hmm. Um, I grew up being involved in art and music, not really being much of a math guy mm -hmm. or a numbers guy. Mm -hmm. I had some interest, um, tertiary interest in science because my dad is a geologist and I got exposed to that growing up. But um, if you told me you're going to do a finance degree and work in a finance related career, I would have laughed at you. Mm -hmm. Took the program, loved it, only found out after the fact that really uh, I was fortunate enough to be at the school that had the premier program in the nation. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. that's a, a providence, a God thing in my mind, just being in the right place at the right time yeah. and having the right person come in and say, come join our program and check it out. And then me just having an affinity for it. Yeah. Yep. Um, so when you went back to tech, you mm -hmm. were a second semester freshman or you were a sophomore? What, what year I was you? technically a first semester junior because first I'd already done junior. my associate's okay. degree okay. Well, that's and right. transferred yep. everything in. Okay. He might have had two credits from Mizzou when he was 18 <laughs> yeah. years old, pushed forward. I'm not sure what. But. Yeah. Uh, not too much came over from there. <laughs> uh, Maybe zero. Right. <laughs> and, then, uh, and so then you were recruited into the program, and then That's right. you graduated from the program. That's and for right. those of our listeners who don't know, this tech was really the first program that was sort of minting uh, financial planners right out of school. That's right. And, and it really wasn't prior to that, there wasn't any kind of curriculum really anywhere in the country. I mean, you studied finance, you know, or economics, or right. but there was nothing for wealth management or wealth planning mm. or financial planning or private, you know, investment, private wealth management, like none of that existed. That's right. Um, it was all, you know, it was all kind of the traditional uh, silos or lines. And if you wanted to go into wealth planning, it was difficult yeah, unless and, you were in a program like this. And they were highly aligned with the idea of being uh, and working with an RIA, mm -hmm. um, which was not mainstream either. Right. Uh, you know, at, For their, sure. at their inception. Because this program. was when? What year? Uh, I think the program was founded in the, I want to say the early to mid 90s. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I, I can't recall exactly when it was founded, but I know that it's been in practice for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, the other interesting thing too, and again, this is probably hearsay, but my understanding is, uh, so the program is through the human sciences college. So I have a bachelor's of science. I don't have a, a business degree. I interesting. Didn't. Um, and the reason that they did it through the human sciences college rather than through the business school is because the business school had a very fixed curriculum and they wanted to include more courses anchored in the human component mm -hmm. of what we do. Yeah. So not just accounting and management, but, uh, debt counseling and crisis management and addiction studies and these things that help you interface and interact with families and human beings. Mm -hmm. Psychology. Uh, yes. Psychology on a regular basis, yep. because those are real issues that we deal with all the time. Yeah. 
Um, and I remember taking addiction studies in, in, in school and being like, okay, this is interesting. And I didn't know this about recovery programs and kind of all of these different things that are going on. But when am I ever going to use this? And then I had my first situation with a trust with a beneficiary that had substance abuse issues. Um, and I was mm. like, wow, this all makes sense now. Yeah. Um, so it was a big, a big aha moment mm-hmm. for me. Well, and so much, of, so much of our business from the outside looking in is a, it's, you know, you think it's all X's and O's, right? right. Like it's, you know, investments and alpha and beta and, you know, all the, all the math and all, all of that. But so much of what it takes to be an effective advisor is emotional intelligence and building trust and being vulnerable and being able to, you know, probe into particular situations or things that are going on in a family or in a, you know, in a relationship to really, to really be able to add value. Not transactional. Not transactional. Relational. Yes. yes. Which is human science is so interesting uh, mm-hmm. that that's the, the school that, that uh, kind of obviously sponsored it. So you graduate. Are you like 40 when you graduate? How old are you when you graduate? <laughs> no, no. I'm teasing. You're not even 40 now, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> so, although I feel like it with two, two young children. Um, I'm still a few years away from that, fortunately. So you graduate. What do you, where, where do you go after? Uh, I knew I wanted to come back to the Dallas area. I knew that this was a spot where there were premier wealth management firms. Um, obviously, I have a network here. I know the people here. I understand the community. And I said, okay, that's where I want to be. Plus, you know, McKinney was a great place to be raised as a family. And, and just this general area is a great place to raise a family. So mm-hmm. I said, okay, one day I will have a family and I want it to be probably in that location. Yep. Uh, plus, I'm a proud Texan and you yep. know, we got to stay right. in Texas. I'm not, wasn't interested in going up to New York or doing anything, chasing any crazy dreams. Um, I had already done enough. I was going to say, you, to that, you'd kind so. of done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have seen a lot of the world. Um, yeah, so I, I uh, sorry, no, uh, I, go. I, I uh, chose to, to come back to Dallas, uh, was fortunate enough that I got to go work for uh, another firm here on their investment team. So I got to spend a year developing really the insights into what goes into kind of the mechanics of portfolio administration, performance reporting, investment manager due hmm. diligence, kind of all of the underlying things that you don't really see the nuts and bolts of our business. Um, and then went to work for a multifamily office in town on their advisory team, um, spent a number of years there kind of progressing through the ranks and working with ultra high net worth families and then made a decision to come work with True North, uh, my culture decision and, uh, and a heart decision to come work with people I knew were aligned with my own personal values. Hmm. So, yeah. and I've been here going on five years and we're blessed to have him absolutely. Married and kids. Tell us about your wife and kiddos. Married uh, with children. Yes, that's correct. Um, I met my wife. uh, She was here on an internship. Uh, She's Chinese. um, So I didn't know I was going to meet or marry a Chinese woman. um, But that's what happened. And that's how life works. Uh, She was here on an internship from Baltimore. Actually, she was at Hopkins doing her master's degree. And she accepted an internship not knowing that it was in Texas, thinking that it was in the Maryland area. <laughs> and then finding out about... What two- a shocker. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> and let me guess, it was July or something too, probably. Yeah, yeah. And then like two weeks before she was supposed to start, they're like, okay, this is the office location. And it was in like Frisco or Plano. Um, so she had to scramble and ended up coming here. We met while she was here. Um, Where'd you meet? We met through uh, through a dating app. Let's go. Which is kind of silly. It's um, not. It's not. But, no, it's not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we met through a dating app, you know, kind of one of those ones that just connects you and your friends and in their network and uh, kind of went on a date with her. Kind of. <laughs> well, like, you know, we, we went on one date and we, we went out to dinner and we had a great time. We really enjoyed meeting each other. kind of a date. She was going back to Baltimore and I was here. My career was here. And I was like, okay, this was fun. You're a nice person. I really enjoyed getting to meet you. But, um, We'll keep in touch, you yeah, know, whatever. Good luck. Yeah. Um, and so she went to visit her sister in LA, who was at UCLA. And uh, I don't know, maybe like three weeks or four weeks later, she she sent me a message. Was like, "Hey, are, are we gonna hang out again?" And I was like, "Okay, sure, why not? I don't have anything better to do. Um, <laughs> you were you were fun, and we had a, we had a great vibe. So why not?" Remind me her name. Uh, her name is Lin Fei. Lin Fei. Mm-hmm. Lin Fei. We're gonna have you on the podcast as well, and we'll make sure that we'll you get the other side, of the, side of the story. Of the story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, well, so we went on our second date and we had a very, uh, like funny idea, like two very differing ideas of what a date should be like. Right. So, um, the one that she proposed was going to an art museum uh, event. So we did that. Right. Of course. And my, my idea was like, let's go to somewhere like, like Pinstack and have drinks and do bowling and play games and just act like children and get to know each other in a totally relaxed environment. 
Well, we ended up doing both. We went to the art event thing early at the Dallas Art Museum. Um, we had a great time, but by the time we got out, we're like, oh, okay, that was very serious. Mm -hmm. um, so then we went to like Campisi's downtown, ate dinner, and then we had the whole evening left. So why not? And, you know, we went and had an amazing time kind of connecting as human beings. And that's when I fell in love with her, yeah. was on that second date. Um, so we continued to date throughout the summer and we decided to do long distance uh, for the entire year as she finished her master's at Hopkins. And so, I would go there for one weekend a month and she would come back here the next, um, the next mm -hmm. month and come visit me. Um, she's smarter than I am. She did environmental engineering at Hopkins. Everybody's like, she medical. And I was like, Nope, I know that's what everybody thinks Hopkins is right. like the only thing they do. Right. But, uh, and then after we did that long distance for a year, she decided she would move here instead of going back to China. So I must've been doing something right. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. I don't know what, but <laughs> what age are the kids? Uh, my, my son is, is just over two and my daughter is four, almost five months old. So young children, we're not sleeping a whole lot right now, but that's part of the fun, right? Part of the fun. Um, yeah, it is. And yeah, we've been married five years now and together eight years. So it kind of flies by when you meet the right person and mm -hmm. uh, get locked into life together. What is your role here at True North? So I am the director of wealth planning, and I've been sitting in that seat uh, officially for a year as of last month. Um, you've accomplished a lot in a year. It's been a fast. It and feels like you've year. been in that seat longer because of all that you, you and your team have accomplished. Yeah, Caleb, what are some ways a business owner could start to try to identify an expert to help them in wealth planning? Obviously, we do that at True North but there's people all over the globe. What are some of the two or three things they should be looking for in a, a, a true wealth planner agency? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to think about, am I working with people that have experience doing this? Okay. So that's just a clarifying question you can ask when you're interviewing anybody who you're going to work with, right? Uh, this is the type of person that I am. This is the type of business that I'm involved in. Do you have experience providing advice around these things? Uh, you know, obviously understanding the people that are involved in the business, what are their credentials, what is their training? Um, those are things that I'd want to see. And then understanding their business model. Yeah. Um, are you a fiduciary? Are you, is your mandate from the SEC and as, in, as a person in the business to look out for my best interests and, and truly do what's best for me at heart? Um, or are you selling products and, and maybe pushing uh, a particular ideology based on how you're compensated? So maybe we don't want to venture into that territory. There are... Uh, profoundly intelligent and talented individuals who work in all realms of Absolutely. our industry. Yeah. And there are many people who work under a non RIA model who still function under a fiduciary standard, um, who hold themselves to that and can give very, very good advice. So big disclaimer there, right? Love that. Um, very want to be very respectful of everybody who's in our industry because it's, it's, uh, it's a broad world and everybody brings a different talent set to the table and every person's un unique needs are different. Yeah. Um, but you know, you do need to work with somebody who understands the nuance of what you're going through and has experience guiding people through, uh, those kind of navigational hazards that yep. exist as you're thinking about what to do with your family and your assets and your business. Mm -hmm. All right. So bottom line there is we're not the only ones who do this well, That's right. but find somebody trusted. Let's dive into what wealth planning really is and what looks like. And, uh, let's help a business owner. One of the things that I think is is different at True North, and, I, and it's very intentional in terms of the way we've built the structure, is we want to empower the wealth manager uh, who's on the front line with the client day in and day out. We want to give them the capacity to build deep relationships with the mm -hmm. clients, where they really, like we were talking about earlier, where they really have the opportunity to understand, and then they're supported by two teams. They're supported by an investment team that's deep, in the analytics on the investment strategy and portfolio. And then they're also supported by the wealth planning team, which Caleb runs. And so what it does is it, it frees up the wealth manager to be really deep in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And when they need to go to these deep resources on investments or wealth planning, they have teams to support them. So it, it sort of frees them up versus them having to be the person to go figure out everything on their own which is the more traditional they way. They get to quarterback that relationship, so to speak, but they've got tremendous experts mm -hmm. at our fingertips to go support. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, it, you know, the flip of that is if you, and you know, burden might not be the right word, but if you burden the wealth manager with, hey, you, you've got to also go figure out the whole wealth planning world 
and the investment world. And oh, by the way, you've got whatever, 30, 40, 50 clients that you've got to take care of. It's, it's a heavy, nobody can do that. You're going to end up being a jack lift. of all trades. Right. You won't, the expertise won't be as deep. Um, as, well, so one of the ahead. other things that our team does also that I think is unique and very important to the overall scale and growth of the business is um, we partner with our junior advisors. And so, you know, one of the things that I think as a firm we strongly believe in is, is growing, developing, and cultivating people inside mm -hmm. the firm rather than going outside and bringing people in when we don't have to. And so, uh, you know, we can have a junior person on, our, on my team sit down with a junior person on the advisory team and they can work through a project together. And so then instead of farming out the work to somebody else and getting no experience doing that, now they are developing the skill set of reviewing an estate plan or working through a cash flow mm -hmm. or a capital sufficiency analysis or thinking through business strategy. And so as junior employees, as junior advisors, now they're now getting critical experience um, and at bats on those individual topics so that as they grow into a more advanced and more senior role, they have built that expertise over time through client work. Yeah, the enterprise knowledge is all staying here. Yep. A bit of a master class on wealth planning, business owners, business leaders. Um, Caleb, what are the two, three, four buckets? Um, I own a business. We've got some wealth. We may be planning for an exit where we have significantly more wealth. Walk us through what are the two, three, four, five, twelve buckets an owner of a company probably needs to be thinking through or a high net worth individual? Yeah. So I would say there's a lot of different answers 100%. to that question. Um, but if you want to back up, the first thing that everybody should be thinking about is the foundation of their family and their life. Um, and, and that's really the foundational planning components of wealth planning, right? So when I say that, I mean, have you, do you have a will? Um, have you taken the time to think about who's the guardian of your young children if you and your, your partner pass away? Have you taken the time to think through how you want your assets to flow, where you want them to go, who are the decision makers, who's telling the doctors what to do with me if I'm incapacitated, who's pulling the financial levers if, if bills still need to get paid and I'm not around to do this? So that's kind of like step one, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't done that portion it's very hard to build any of the other components of wealth planning mm -hmm. on top of that, because that's really the, the initial layer of support. Um, and, and sure, capital sufficiency, cash flow, liquidity, those things are all important. Um, and, and you can't function if you don't have liquidity, right? Mm -hmm. but, yeah. um, but having that foundational layer to know that I've made these key decisions and this is where things are going and this is how it's happening is kind of step one. Are you surprised by the percentage of people who maybe we would think, when should I start this? When should I get this foundational piece in order? As soon as possible. <laughs> uh, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you don't answer. have it, if you don't have it, it was yesterday. It was yesterday. Yeah. But you'd be surprised by the number of highly successful individuals who have none. Mm -hmm. And they get busy with life and managing the business, mm -hmm. and they, they have an idea or a plan in their head, and they've just never done anything with it. And, well, and most 40-year-olds still feel pretty bulletproof. At that point, that's right, and and you are knee deep running your and growing your business. That's right. Well, we we talked about this before on the podcast, where you know it's it as a business owner, it's all consuming. Yes, particularly when you're getting started, building, launching, and and you're kind of like I'll, I'll get to that one day, but then the the business grows and it gets bigger and it's more complex and more moving parts, and one day becomes years. Yep, and then you wake up and you know somebody sits you and down then one and day says sneaks up on you. Yeah. We see that a lot. Yep. It's very, very common. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is, is doing that process actually doesn't take a whole lot of time. Um, but it takes enough self-moderation to sit down and say, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to spend an hour mm. with my wealth advisor and talk through the big decisions here. And then maybe another hour later on refining that. Mm -hmm. And then we can go give that all to an attorney and they can, you know, suss out the remaining details that need to be yep. finalized. But it's not like it takes... 15 hours of work. I tell you what it takes is, and, and you know, it's, I'm the cobbler's kid, right? Yep. Uh, I, I get so busy focused on, you know, true North and everything that's going on. If it were not for our wealth planning team, my own wealth planning would mm -hmm. be 
would would be uh, would not be up to date. Mm-hmm. Would not be what it needs to be. And it's not that it's not important to me. I see it every day. It's super important. But it's just it's it's me having the discipline. And so having Caleb or Jamie sit me down for one hour a quarter and we you know we we talk about whatever we need to talk about and then we have our our execution items and then the team mm-hmm. goes away and they they do their part and i usually have an, a homework assignment or two and then and we get back together the next quarter for another hour or so and and we can keep incrementally moving it forward but if it were not for the for the team you know sort of an external force helping mm-hmm. me you just you just get busy life gets busy yep that's why I love I love your term self moderation. Just mm-hmm. well, yeah. So that's that's step one, really. Um, you know, I would say step two is kind of revisiting the drawing board and, and thinking about the beginning and the end. So, um, and what I mean by that is, there's really only two outcomes with a business or with assets. Um, you're either going to sell them at some point and have a liquidity event. Or you're going to retain it, and it's going to go to heirs, right? There's not really any other outcome. Maybe it's some mixture. Maybe it's somewhere on the spectrum in between. You own less or more. That's kind of the two ultimate ends. And so you kind of also have to go, okay, if I have my foundational planning done, now I need to think about as, as a business owner, what do I actually want to have happen with this business? Mm. Am I going to own it forever? Is it going to pass to my heirs? Um, am I going to sell it? And what's my plan? Because that further informs the type of decision making that you should be making. Um, you know, if if you don't intend for your heirs to have the business, well, then you probably should have a plan to exit the business before <laughs> before you get to the point that you have heirs, right? Before you get to the point where it's now the heirs' responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you don't think your business partner wants to be in business with your spouse or your kids, you probably need to have a plan around that as well. Mm-hmm. So that kind of ties into like two buckets that go alongside each other, which is thinking about business structure and strategy, but also thinking about risk. And so I think as individuals, particularly when we're involved in things that we have a high degree of control over or very familiar with, we tend to underestimate risk Mm. and the the impact that significant changes in our life can have on the things that we have material control over. So um, whether that's a papered up agreement with your business partner for buy sell or some type of insurance policy to provide liquidity for your estate in the event that you pass, um, there's many different areas of risk that you should be thinking. It could be, it could be something as simple as liability insurance, like your umbrella policy. Do you have enough umbrella policy that mm-hmm. if you get sued tomorrow, you don't have to liquidate, you know, your assets to go pay some kind of judgment. Those are significant risks, uh, particularly in a highly litigious society, um, that exist. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, you know, those are other aspects that should be on your mind, but as a busy person, you may not be thinking about. Well, and I think that's the risk side of the equation is probably the thing that uh, most business owners don't give enough attention to. Cause mm-hmm. I think a lot of business owners are like, yeah, I need to have my estate plan. I might need a family partnership. I might need some trust set up for some of these assets. I'm, they might be getting into the generational skipping aspect of partitioning assets away but they're probably not thinking so much about if I go down in a plane tomorrow That's right. and this asset is left behind, how's that all going to be taken? How's, you know, they might have some life insurance, but you know, how are you going to have liquidity for the business to buy the spouse out of the business and all these other things the, the risk side of the equation is the one that I, I don't think we think about as much and partly because of what you said, Doug, you know, we, when we're young, we feel like we're bulletproof and, you know, those things that happen, that's somebody else. Mm-hmm. That's not me. But mm-hmm. the reality is, you know, we need to be careful and thoughtful about both. Yeah. And I think there's, uh, you know, a couple of other components of that too, right? Like, so, uh, I'm a business owner. My business is worth $2 million today, but it becomes $120 million, uh, in a couple of years. And now I have a taxable estate. And, uh, you know, it's likely that the entire value of my taxable estate is tied up in the business, Mm -hmm. which is completely and totally illiquid. And if I die tomorrow with a $120 million estate, well, now I have an estate tax bill that's tens of millions of dollars. How am I going to pay for that? How am I going to pay for that without being forced to liquidate my business? Um, And that's not a good situation to be in. Right. Uh, The other thing, too, is I think uh, another material component of underestimating risk or under under, uh, judging the amount of risk you have is not thinking about the entire picture of your capital. 
uh, it's not just the dollars on a page and the business value, but your human capital is significantly invested in your business and the things that you're doing. The time that you spend, the material amount of labor that you put into to what you're you know, achieving, mm -hmm. um, those are real tangible things. It may not be, it's not something you can hold in your hands, but the outcomes are real. And if you're the primary earner for your family, um, those are other risk areas. If you're gone, well, then where does provision for your family come from? Mm -hmm. Who's managing and running the business? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the investing world talks heavily about diversification of, of investment assets, but we need to diversify our human capital as well. And so whether that's through, um, you know, delegating um, or contracts or written, written language or insurance policies or whatever it is, there should be some type of plan to help diversify your human capital as well over time. Um, so those are kind of like the first things that come to mind when I think about a traditional business owner who maybe hasn't done a whole lot yet. Um, and then there's more to build on on top of that. Yeah, and I think we see, you know, it's not uncommon to see that the, that first level has not been addressed. Yeah. Or if it has been addressed, maybe it was a decade ago before there were kids. Yeah. and you know, life has gotten more complex and things need to be updated and our laws are always changing. That's right. Mm -hmm. So there's always, there's always that and you're sort of keeping up with legislation and what's happening there. And then I think, you know, less in that second layer, you know, less people are as prepared there. And then maybe the third layer that you're going to go to, I'll tee it up for you. is just the, you know, the, the creative things that you can do pre transaction. If you've got, you know, couple of years to sort of set things up that can be very creative, very um, transformational for your family from a wealth planning perspective. Very few people take that next step. That's right. And so there's, there's what I would say there is, is time is always of the essence. Um, you know, obviously time is our most precious resource and it's something we can never get more of. Um, but that is also a true story for your business. And so uh, as you have a business that's growing and your valuation is small, um, you have so much opportunity to do significant and impactful planning in advance of uh, this kind of explosion of value that could happen at any moment, right? Right. You have a good couple of years and all of a sudden your EBITDA is massively increased, your revenue's up and your business is now worth significantly more than you ever expected it to be worth. Um, well, if you didn't do the planning two years ago before that happened, the, the amount of benefit that you can reap from business planning and, and, and doing that process as part of your estate plan is significantly reduced. That window mm -hmm. has now closed. That door has now closed. Can, can you give us a simple example? Is, uh, it's a complex idea, but a simple example of, you know, if you, if you did it, you know, you got a $2 million valuation, now you have a $100 million valuation. And if you'd done some of the things that we know are possible when you had a $2 million valuation, what the impact of that would be versus not. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, you have a $2 million business, you're able to give half of it away now. So I don't know how much our listeners may know about uh, lifetime exclusion and kind of all of these other things that exist, but you have a certain amount of money that you can give away. And the government says you have a limit to how much you can do. And right now it's the highest it's ever been right at about $13 million per person. Um, and that's set to go away in a couple of years. So you have a, a very, the largest window there's ever been to do planning now. Um, and we know for a fact that if nobody in Washington goes and makes changes to the laws, this goes away in two years, right? So it goes away at the end of 2025. But as a simple example, if I took half of a $2 million business and I put it into some type of structure that is no longer in my estate and that has been given a uh, GST exemption as well, so generation skipping tax exemption, it doesn't matter if that becomes a billion dollars in the future. It's already been pulled and removed from your estate. And because you did it when the value was small, you could give away a significant portion of your business or your assets before uh, this significant change happened. And that entire amount is covered by the initial planning that you originally did. So if you're, two, if you're $1 million half of that business becomes $50 million, well, you've just sidestepped a $20 million estate tax bill. Uh, um, so it's highly impactful. Um, to do those things earlier rather than later, because once your business is worth a hundred million dollars, well, sure, you can still go, go give your $26 million away, but that's not the same as giving away $1 million today. That's now worth $50 million a few years from now. That's right. So what's an example there of, they have a $2 million business. What would they 
structurally, what would they put into the trust? Uh, it could be it could be set up many different ways. Um, you could have uh, a trust for future beneficiaries um, that could be a, an owner of the business, or it could own it through a, a partnership vehicle, depending on your total net worth and you know, kind of what's appropriate for your family. Uh, you know, if you have a $2 million balance sheet, I may not go and recommend that you do a family limited partnership. Mm -hmm. But if you have a $20 million balance sheet and you've got a business that's worth 5 million, then that's definitely an option you should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, there's other types of trusts and mechanisms that can be created. Um, many, many different tools essentially in the toolbox. And uh, that's something your wealth advisor and your estate planning attorney should be mm -hmm. really collaborating on in concert to help you come to the right answers. That's right. Um, so that's, that's another you know, just angle to think about these things with is, okay, I've got my foundational planning. I've thought about risk. I'm protected in that category. Now I need to think ahead mm -hmm. a little bit. I need to get least. out in front of this. And I need to get out in front of this before it becomes an issue. Yeah. And, and really it ties into another point that I'd like to make, which is something I like to call the power of, of having good partners, right? So the people that you surround yourself with, the professionals that you surround yourself with as a business owner, um, is highly impactful to the net outcomes that you have later in life, right? So, uh, you know, if we want to break it down in simple terms, the doctor you choose, if you develop mm -hmm. cancer later in your life, has a huge impact on your chances of survival and the type of outcomes that you have as an individual, right? It's the exact same story for your business, for your financial health and well being, um, and for the type of structures and mechanisms that you build for your family over time that ensures that your kids and their kids and their kids are taken care of mm -hmm. and, uh, or that your philanthropic goals are met, that your impact to the community is felt, you know, all of those things require good partnership and people that are experts in those realms. One of the things that I think we, that we've observed over the years is, you know, when you assemble your team, so your CPA, your, your estate planning attorney, your insurance, and you could have multiple insurance providers, life insurance, health, uh, property and casualty, a wealth advisor. Like as you assemble the team, the, the, a banker, you know, for the mm -hmm. commercial lending needs, each of the team members has a personality. Mm -hmm. And if you just line them all up, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, your CPA and your state planning attorney, as an example, highly technical, mm -hmm. you know, very technically trained. Mm -hmm. I mean, law school, three years, you know, uh, CPA, you, you know, your extra education to, to get designated as a CPA, very technical training. Uh, our, what we found is a lot of times our technical experts are very, they're very good at processing what we, what, what's asked of them. Yep. But then when they finish, you know, project A, they go on to project B. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they just, because of the way their worlds are set up, they, it's hard for them to be as proactive and think ahead. Um, oftentimes, traditional investment advisor, broker, insurance person is more, uh, more aligned around a salesperson, a yep. sales yep. process. Yep. And so, you know, the goal is a product sale. And um, so what ends up happening is a lot of times your team that you've built around you is uh, a conglomeration of salespeople and technical experts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not right, not wrong, not good, not bad. Just It's just the personalities. And so with technicians, oftentimes they're just moving on to the next thing. Think about your CPA who's mo moving from tax filing deadline to Correct. tax I filing deadline. Doug's return, Caleb's return. Scott's return. Well, and then I go from personal return to corporate return right. to nonprofit return, right. all which have a different filing date. Um, and so, and then the, you know, the salesperson, you know, typically is looking for the product opportunity. A banker is usually waiting for someone to call them. And when they do like, Hey, we've got all this that we can offer. So I think one of the things as you build a team is someone on the team needs to be the quarterback. Uh, and lots of people say they're the quarterback, but someone really needs to own that role because that role is the person that looks ahead and says, here's what's coming. Here's where we're going. Mr. and Ms. Client, you may not realize this, but here's some things that are going to happen over the next three, four, five years as your business grows and the valuation doubles or triples or quadruples. Here's some things we need to be thinking about and we need to get on that now. And I think that's one of the things that, that we do try to do at true north is to to be out in front of the relationship um and not be you know recognize the value of the technicians 
recognize the value of the salespeople in the process, but recognize also that someone has to be the quarterback that's really looking forward at where we're, where we're headed. Yep. Yep. And someone it, has to be conducting the orchestra. That's right. And, and you have talked so much really Kayla about strategy and planning who is setting that course as opposed to just checking that box. This tactical piece is done. Who, who, who's the strategy uh, and who's the consultant? Would you have said? You know, realistically, uh, the person who should be helping you with that is your wealth advisor. Um, you know, and, and I spoke earlier about helping develop well-rounded advisors and, and build their skill set in, in all realms, and it's because they need to be able to do this. Yep. Um, you know, the person who's managing your money shouldn't just be looking at C-SPAN all day and, and making market decisions based on uh, investment managers. They should also be thinking about uh, what's going on in your life, um, what decisions are you making that are changing your individual picture on a daily basis, uh, monthly basis, annual basis? They should understand what's important to you and your family. What's, mm -hmm. you know, do you have an individual mission as a family or uh, a set of values that you've built out? Well, they should know that and they should be helping you make decisions and strategize around that. Um, and really, uh, connecting all of those individual threads in your life. So, um, you know, in all of my years as a client advisor, um, that's the role that I served. Um, you know, I'm talking with your estate planner. I'm talking with your CPA. I'm talking with all these technical experts and salespeople, as you mentioned, Scott, and it's my job to bring the executive summary together and say, okay, um, to my clients, here is, here's the summary of mm -hmm. everything that's going on. Here's the most important pieces. Here's the nuance. Mm -hmm. And this is why we're doing what we're doing. And then to help you understand it and, and be able to make relevant decisions about things that are impactful to you with fully equipped with the knowledge to understand why you're making those decisions, not just saying, this is the most math correct thing. Now go sign this document. That's well, right. if we're going to make that decision, you should understand why. That's right. Um, and you know, also to tag along with that, there's always a right math answer. But that's not necessarily the right answer for you mm -hmm. and your family. Good. And that's a really hard concept. I think that people struggle with. Sometimes they go, I don't want to pay taxes. Well, that's great. We can get super complex and create all kinds of structures of things to minimize and mitigate the total amount of tax you have to pay uh, once you pass with your large estate. But it's highly complex. And the people that you leave behind when you pass may or may not have the capacity to understand or manage that you may not want the complexity of that in your life. So sure, it looks great on paper, but it may not be the right answer for you. And we may be able to get, you know, 60% or 80% of the same optimal outcome with a much simpler solution that allows you to sleep at night and pay attention to the things that you're passionate about and not just be like, okay, I did the right thing because that's what it said on the paper. Right. Um, and, you, and you might have been able to solve that more simply had they just called sooner. Possibly. Because getting ahead, yeah. can, it just feels like one of these things that we hit over and over and over again. We're busy growing a business. You're in that moment of feeling bulletproof for too long, and it just sneaks up on, sneaks up on us when decisions are starting to really have to be made. Well, and here's the thing. The earlier you start, the more measured the pace can be. Yes. Right? You can take little chunks at a time, once a quarter, yep. and move towards these goals over a period of a couple of years. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, if the time frame is compressed, then it's a heavy lift and, and windows are closing, right? As soon and, as you and tools in the tool kit are are getting probably fewer. That's right. So mm -hmm. where I'd like to kind of bring this home and I'd love to you to take a second, Caleb, because you're so dang smart and gifted at what you do. We're in this cafe, and you remember we talked about this. There's four or five business owners kind of eavesdropping mm -hmm. in the conversation. One of them has an LOI to sell their business, okay? The other three own a business. But I want you to kind of sum up this conversation with kind of a real tactical one, two, three. I call you, Caleb. Caleb, I got an LOI for X amount of million. What do I do? And while you're telling me what to do, know that the other three people you're looking at saying, you, you, and you, don't be that dummy who called me with an LOI. <laughs> you should have called me two years before. 
Does the premise make sense? It does. Go. Um, okay. I'll try and keep this as Reader's Digest as possible. Short, short and sweet. I bet you can. Um, so to the person with the LOI, you know, really that window has closed. Anytime a valuation is starting to be attached to your business, the IRS is going to tie back to that valuation for the, you know, what you're ultimately using for your gifting or your estate planning strategy. And so, you know, there's some nuance to that and there's some wiggle room, but, but realistically, if you've expressed interest in selling your business formally and you're in this process, you're kind of stuck. So you're going to say to Doug at that cafe, congrats. You're hosed. <laughs> but you should have called me sooner. Well, yeah, you should have called. You're not going to guilt me, but yeah. Doug, you lost some window. You okay. lost you lost some window. And part part of the reason you've lost the window is because a significant part of what you can do is as you gift away potentially part of the asset is to take discounts, um, minority interest, um, non control. Like there's there's ways to get discounts on the value that you gift. As soon as you have the IRS, as soon as you have an LOI, now you have a real valuation. It's the the value of the business is less clear when there's no LOI. Yep. When there's an LOI, it's pretty darn clear. Okay. Yeah. Well, and and we spoke slightly about this earlier, right? That that you can give a lot away, a lot more away when your company's worth far less, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing is you know I'm going to have to say congratulations on your upcoming liquidity event. There's not really anything we can do with the existing business besides maybe some mechanics of if you're uh, you know charitably inclined, if you're interested yeah. in philanthropy or some other things like that, um, you know, and, and aside from making sure that you've worked with, you know, the right CPAs and, and attorneys to make sure you've structured everything appropriately for, for transacting a deal. Um, the secondary piece of that I'm going to say is, you know, what's your game plan going forward? Have you thought right. about what you're going to do? Right. And maybe you're not selling the whole business. Maybe you are, but you know, you're going to have a large infusion of cash. Um, and we need to decide what to do with that. And you may or may not have significantly more time and we need to decide what to do with that for mm -hmm. you as an individual. And, and you know, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with stories of people retiring or selling their business and then they kind of become lost over time yep. because they have no plan. Right. So those are other conversations that need to happen. And that's a whole other hour long plus session. Exactly. Like, and, discussion, but. and just to add to that, there is, you know, if someone's selling a minority stake or a piece of the business and they're rolling a significant chunk of equity there's an opportunity with that piece That's right. on a go forward that you can begin to work on as part of the process. Yeah. So, that's, so all is not lost, but yep. that's right. Yep. That's right. So that's step one. Um, and then when we get into that conversation about what are you going to do with yourself, if you tell me I'm going to start another business, well then I'm going to say, there's our planning opportunities yes, because right. now you're going to have a, a seedling, a fledgling business, um, that can potentially be, you know, all of these other neat and cute things that we can do, we can do with that business, that new venture. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm going to circle back to these other things we talked about. Do you have your wills and ancillary documents? Do you have your foundational planning done? Do you have a plan for your family if something happens to you tomorrow? Have you thought about, you know, depending on the size of your liquidity event, what an estate tax bill might look like? Have you thought about, are you leveling up or changing your lifestyle to go along with your liquidity event? And if so, what does that look like? And, hmm. you know, if you're going to go buy an airplane and three more houses and do all of these interesting things, well, that's great. And you have the liquidity to do that now. But how does that tie into a long-term picture for you? And is that sustainable? Um, so we're going to start having those conversations. And then, you know, I'm going to start thinking about all those other things we talked about. Risk. Yep. Do you have the right liability protection? Now you have tangible assets that are outside of the business if you get in a car wreck on Dallas North Tollway tomorrow and you injure somebody, you're exposed. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody's walking down the street and your dog bites them in the yard, you're exposed. Um, so that's really the next steps. And then all the people that are there that don't have an LOI, I'm going to say, see, listen to all these things. <laughs> and you need to go do these as well because your opportunity set is even greater that's right. than this individual who's about to transact. You have so many opportunities to do so many great things, but you need to start doing it now. And this is why... You know, the statistic is that we repeat often, 75% of all business owners and entrepreneurs profoundly regret selling their business 12 to 18 months post-transaction. And this is the reason we started working on this at True North was we want to help business owners and entrepreneurs exit better and maximize all the things that are readily available to them. But to do that, you have to start early. You have to move upstream and that's why we call it pre-transaction planning. That's right. And I, you know, my goal also would be to redirect the thought process to the diversification co uh, component that we talked about earlier, human capital and in investment assets. 
you understand your business. You understand that, sp that space, that realm that you're an expert in, and you can control the levers of power, and you feel very comfortable with that, but it's still a concentrated risk. And so now you've had the ability to take chips off the table, mm -hmm. so to speak. You know, you've, you've won big at the table, you take your chips off. Well, maybe you need to pocket some of that and put it somewhere else, doing something else in a totally different style or vein of what you're used to. That's going to feel a little bit uncomfortable because you're not going to have the same level of control anymore. Mm -hmm. However, uh, those are the assets that should allow you to weather the storm should there be adverse uh, scenarios in the future. And, and really, as somebody who's concerned with your well-being, your financial well-being and your family's well-being, it's my job, it's my duty to make sure that we're having those conversations and they are also uh, uh, taking those actions and those steps. Mm -hmm. Well said. You own a business, make a call now to someone to help you. It's never too soon to start planning. Stay busy in your business, but make a call. Can you imagine Tiger Woods not having a nutritionist, a, phys a physician, a trainer, someone to help coach them to get to the level where they are? You need coaches. You need experts. You need trusted partners. Uh, make a couple of calls. Kayla, this is awesome. Um, this has been so helpful. Thank you for your time. And uh, business owners, leaders, uh, thank you for choosing to be a part of Decision Points. Have a great day.